Hi, I'm Professor David Adley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In this video, I'll be talking to you about what the interior of the Earth is like and how we know that. Let's get started. The Earth is marked by different layers with different temperatures and densities as you work your way from the surface of the Earth, which we call its crust, all the way down towards its deep interior. We see some consistent patterns within these layers as we work our way in, which include an increase in both the density and temperature of material going from the surface of the Earth towards its interior. The surface of the Earth is covered by a layer that we call the Earth's crust. It's a layer of low-density solid rock that floats on top of the slightly more dense mantle material. Depending on where exactly you are in the Earth, the crust can have a thickness ranging from about 50 to about 10 kilometers. Um, 50 kilometers is like the really high mountains, 10 is more like the deep parts of the ocean, but it's very, very thin compared to the total size of the Earth. If you go to the store and you buy an onion and you look at that paper layer that kind of protects the outside of the onion, the thickness of that papery layer on the outside of the onion is about the same, proportionally speaking, as the thickness of the crust compared to the whole Earth. So the crust is actually a very, very tiny part of the Earth as a whole. Beneath that is the mantle, which instead of being solid, like the crust, is much more plastic. The best analogy that I've been able to come up with is to think of sort of the consistency of jello, where jello, if you poke it, it'll move and it can flow around under pressure, but if you just let it go and leave it alone, it will hold its shape. And then beneath the mantle, there are two different parts of the Earth's core. The Earth's core is made up of dense metallic material, primarily iron. The outer core is liquid iron, but the inner core, despite being hotter, is actually solid, and that's because of the tremendous pressure that the inner core is under due to the weight of everything up above it pressing down on top of it. This structure, where the Earth is organized into different layers based on the density of the material that makes them up, is called differentiated, or differentiation. So the actual structure is differentiation, and we say that the Earth is differentiated. Part of the reason for the increase in temperature and density as we work our way in is the necessity for the Earth to maintain what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. There are other reasons, especially for the increase in density, including differentiation, but hydrostatic equilibrium is an important part of the internal structure of the Earth, and indeed for the internal structure of all planets and also for stars. In fact, this is the primary observed feature that marks planets and dwarf planets apart from, say, comets or asteroids. As planets increase their mass, their gravity starts to deform their overall structure and forces them into this spherical shape that best allows the body to exert outward pressure and fight the inward force of gravity. Okay, so we've got this inward force of gravity, it's pulling in towards the center of the object, and in the absence of any other forces, that would cause the whole thing just to collapse to a black hole. So there has to be some kind of outward force that balances that inward force of gravity, and that outward force is pressure. The source of the pressure varies depending on what type of object we're talking about. In the case of planets, the compressibility or incompressibility of materials generally makes a pretty big impact, but stars, which are made of gas and are very compressible, also have this same hydrostatic equilibrium. Generally, what we see is that as we work our way towards the interior of stars or planets, we see an increase both in the temperature and in the density of materials, and those work together to increase the overall local pressure. You can experience this yourself if you go up to the mountains or if you, say, take a ride in a subway tunnel and you go under a river or something. 
you can feel a change in the overall air pressure with altitude. And that change in air pressure is due to the necessity of maintaining hydrostatic equilibrium within the atmosphere. If you go up to higher elevation, there's less mass pushing, pushing down on the atmosphere. And as a result of that, there's less pressure needed to counterbalance that mass. And so the air pressure as you go up in altitude decreases, and as you go down in altitude, it increases. So how do we know all of this stuff about what the inside of the Earth is like? We can't just dig a really deep hole. There's a couple good reasons for that. One, if you get deep enough, you will just melt, melt your tools. If you somehow manage to keep going deeper, eventually you'd even melt the surrounding rock. So that rock would just collapse back in and fill in your hole, and you'd be stuck. So we can't dig a deep hole inside the Earth. What we have to do instead is rely on earthquakes to tell us what the inside of the Earth is like. Earthquakes produce a bunch of different types of waves when they occur. Two important ones include pressure waves, which are depicted across the top of the slide. These are sound waves, so compressions. You take the slinky and you, you push on it, and it creates a ripple that moves across the slinky. So you increase the local density. That's sound. Earthquakes also produce shear waves. So you take the rock and you shake it up and down and you send ripples out in the surface or in the interior of the rock from the location of the earthquake. These shear waves, for example, are one of the main ways that earthquakes do damage. If you've got one side of the building going up and the other side of a building going down along the shear wave traveling along the surface, that's gonna tend to force the building to bend and flex. In many older style buildings, particularly ones made from brick or stone, don't generally respond well to those flexing forces, and they tend to fall apart. More modern buildings, especially ones with steel superstructures, are designed to withstand at least some magnitudes of earthquakes, particularly in places like Tokyo or LA or San Francisco, which are particularly earthquake prone. So we've got these two different types of earthquake waves. We've got the pressure waves, which are compression waves or sound, and then we've got the shear waves, which come just by taking a solid object and wiggling it. We can use the ways that these propagate inside the Earth to tell us a lot about what's going on inside the Earth itself. And in some ways, this is kind of similar to if you go to the doctor and you get a sonogram. So if you're pregnant or if you've got a gallstone or something and the doctor uses a sonogram to look inside, that person is using sound and they're bouncing sound around inside your body. The sound gets returned differently off your organs and off different parts of your guts, not to put too fine a point on it. And then a computer takes those returning sound waves and it uses them to render an image that you can see on a computer screen. And we can do a similar process with the Earth. Sound travels through gases and liquids just fine. So if you're listening to this, you're hearing the sound of my voice traveling through at least some air. There's some air between me and my computer microphone and probably some between your headphones or your computer speakers and then your ears. So sound waves, pressure waves, travel through liquids and gases with no trouble. Shear waves, on the other hand, do not do well at all with fluids. If you imagine taking just a bunch of water and lifting that up and trying to flex it in your fingers, it's just gonna fall right through your hands and make a big old mess. So shear waves cannot travel through liquids. And so by watching the way that pressure waves, P waves, and shear waves, S waves, travel through the interior of the Earth, we can get a sense for the Earth's internal structure. So we see, depicted on the right-hand side of the slide, what happens to pressure waves as they move through the Earth. And they follow these curved paths because the wave speeds are different with different conditions of temperature and pressure. And you see the P waves show up at different places along the Earth with different intensities. You see those pressure waves move through the Earth's core. Remember, the outer core is made of liquid iron. So the pressure waves, they bend a little bit at that interface, but they more or less go right through. 
The shear waves, on the other hand, hit that liquid outer core and they bounce off. So they're going to hit that liquid outer core going down and then they're going to bounce off and go back in some random direction. So we see a big shadow on the far side of the Earth where no S waves are going to show up. So let me go back to that previous image. You'll see that there is a little bit of a shadow zone caused by the bending of the P waves as they move through the Earth's core, but it's nowhere near as extensive. So we can take advantage of these different properties to figure out what the inside of the Earth is like. Basically, what we do is we build a computer model. So we use the laws of physics that we know about to guess the Earth's internal structure, and then based on that guess, our hypothesis, we can predict how earthquakes ought to propagate through that computer model. So we can predict where different types of waves, so S waves versus P waves, will show up along the surface of the Earth. We can predict how long it will take them to get there, how much strength they'll have when they arrive, and then we can compare that with measurements from an actual earthquake. But we don't do this just once. We use lots of different earthquakes at lots of different locations all across the Earth. And by trying to successfully predict the outcome of all of those different earthquake experiments, we can determine whether or not our computer model is doing a good job matching the Earth's interior. If it is, we're in good shape. And then if it's not, maybe we need to tweak something. And then over time, we converge towards a better and better understanding of what's going on deep inside the Earth's interior. In this video, we've talked about what the inside of the Earth is like. I told you that the Earth has several different layers, including say, a mantle, which is a little bit plastic, so you can bend it, but it mostly holds its shape, versus, say, the iron core. And the iron core has a couple of different layers. It has a liquid layer and a solid layer. And we know all of this by watching how earthquakes produce waves and seeing how those waves move through the Earth. By trying to model that process using computers, we can predict how the waves should look and figure out if our model is doing a good job describing the Earth's interior. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again soon for another Topic in Astronomy.